So I'm the third Tim today. There are no more Tims, which is probably a good thing. I'm also uh, feeling a bit pathetic. I'm just uh, uh, recovering from a cold. Well, when I say cold, it's man flu, so it's a, a miracle that I'm standing here at all, really. Uh, but my voice is going, so I'm, I'll hopefully get through this and you can still hear. Otherwise, I'll have to sort of, I don't know, break into interpretive dance and explain what I'm doing through the medium of jumping around. But it's a very simple message I want to get across, which is engineers are important. Uh, fact one, we have a problem that not enough people want to become engineers. So I'm going to do a three-part talk. Firstly, explain the problem. Secondly, point the, to the fact that this is a, there is a misconception about engineering, particularly amongst young people, which is very worrying, which plays to what we heard this morning from Evan and others. And thirdly, to invite you, if you're interested, to become part of the solution. Okay? So the talk is really stemmed by this, uh, kicked off by this picture here. So I'm doing some work at the moment on uh, young people's perception of engineering. Um, and I contacted a local school and said, uh, could you find, in a class of ten, nine, ten-year-olds, just sit them down and give them a piece of paper and a pencil and say, can you draw a picture of an engineer? Okay, that was the only instruction. And this is what we came back with. So I had 30-odd pictures like this of men with big boots holding hammers and spanners. So if you look, you can see there's the hammer and the spanner, hammer and the spanner, hammer and the spanner, hammer and the spanner. Big boots. You go, okay, well, yeah, some engineers do wear big boots and have hammers and spanners. I look through the next one, the next one, the next one. They're all the same. All right, men, hammers, spanners, boots. And then the next thing was, what do engineers do? And so these pictures came, these pictures came back. And they're very good pictures, I think you'll agree. Uh, one is somebody fixing a train. The other one is somebody fixing a car. And these were typical of the pictures we got back. And the children are absolutely right. Engineers do sometimes use hammers, spanners, sometimes wear big boots, and they do fix things. That's a very important and valuable role. But what was horrifying was that's where it stopped. That's all engineering is to some people, particularly worrying the fact that these are young people who are still at the dreaming, I can do anything with my life phase. And they say, all, if I was an engineer, I would be limited to what I do. Important, but limited. So we thought, oh, well, we'll look at some research on this. And so Siemens and a company called, what were they called? World Skills did a survey of 11 to 14-year-olds and asked them what they thought engineering was. And the first word that came back was, it's a dirty profession, it's a grubby, you get messy in engineering. Again, not necessarily bad for children to think that the profession is dirty. They, uh, this alarmed me a bit. They said it was boring. Okay, okay that's not good at all. I can see that it you know, might not appeal to everybody, but to say it's boring, it's a bit worrying. But most terrifying was the fact they said it's not important. Not important. I'm a bit biased, I'm engineering, academic, and all that, but come on, engineering is important. I, I just thought that was a, was a given. And if we have a, a large proportion of young people saying engineering is not important, that can't be good. Particularly as we have a bit of a problem. So there's the wonderful, I think it's called the blue marble photo, looking at the planet, all the, the uh, infinite number of problems and opportunities we're facing at the moment. We need engineers to do something about that, and if the very people who could do this think it's a dirty, boring, not important profession, that's a worry. So, there was another bit to the survey which was asking parents, did you want your children to become an engineer? And very pleasingly, 83% said, yes, we'd, we'd encourage our child or children to become engineers if they were so minded. That's great. I thought, ah, so just a bit of a mismatch here, but why is there such a mismatch? And it's probably partly because of this figure. 75% of parents who wanted their children to become engineers didn't know what to tell them, didn't know what to advise them, didn't know how to encourage them to do this. And that, I think, has a knock-on effect through school in all sorts of ways that young people are not necessarily always getting the advice they need. So the solution is to try and correct a particular misconception through 10 words. So in my remaining 15 minutes, all I'm going to do is talk about the 10 words that I think define engineering. So first of all, the first word, not very interesting word, is invent. Engineers are inventors by nature. They are creative people who will look at a problem and go through a process something like this. I don't understand that. I found a solution. Okay? Simple. That's invention. Very important part <laughs> of engineering. Okay? But that's, that's a tiny fraction of it. It's ve we could talk for uh, weeks on the subject of invention. But engineers do the very interesting thing, which is not just invent, they do which I brilliantly summarise here by adding a red arrow. Okay, so that's the bit afterwards. And in particular, as an example, there's Leonardo's aerial copter thing that he invented a few hundred years ago. Fant very clever, might have worked, might not have worked, but it was a great invention. The engineers are the ones who said, all right, let's have a go at that. And they built 
a helicopter. They built something that could actually do this heavier than air, lifting straight off the ground trick, which is a pretty neat trick, and has led to great uh, uh, craft like this, the twin-bladed Chinook type aircraft. So that's all very interesting. The other thing they do is they improve. Engineers improve things. You can see from that early helicopter to the ones we have today, huge improvement. Another example of improvement is, for those of you who have them easily to hand, could you get your mobile phone out? You don't have to do anything with it, just get it out. Okay, and I challenge you now to say engineers aren't good improvers. So look at that phone and think of the, well, hundreds of functions it has. I'm then going to take you back to an era before some of you were born, where some of you were perhaps still alive, but this is what a mobile phone used to look like. It's a proper phone. You could say the engineers, when asked to make a mobile phone, they said, sure, it's got to have, you know, it's got to be portable. It's portable. Got to make calls. Makes calls. Done. Job done. We're finished. But look at your phone now and look at the difference between this and that. That's what engineering is about as well. It's about improving and adding functionality in some ways or taking functionality and compl complexity away in some cases. Engineers do that. They're all about improving things. They're also very, very good at sharing. So I wanted some pictures to sum up what engineers do. And I came up with these four here, randomly selected from some of our students doing project work. And engineers work in teams. And it's more than just, oh, here are some students working together. Students work together. Sometimes they're introspective. Sometimes they're more outgoing. But they need to do both. But what I found really interesting was this rather wordy quote here. So this guy here, an Australian academic, been teaching engineering for years decided to go and survey his students who'd gone on to work over a period of time. And he said, not what job are you in, but what do you do? And they all came back saying things which were largely could be summarized as this. Engineering is really about distributed expertise enacted through social interaction between people. And to be a good engineer, you can't just sit on your own. Sometimes you do, but engineering is really about accessing expertise that's distributed. It's about social interactions. And engineers, good engineers, know this and do it very well. Engineers are also about shaping physical things. So the basic, you know, hammer spanner, you know, things you can drop on your foot, very important. Engineers do very clever things with material to produce fantastic things like this. But the same basic process is here of, so to make those two, there's a process of um, deformation, adding, subtracting material, and maybe a bit of heat treating, rub it in your hands to make it softer, some chemical process, depending on what the material is. It's the same set of processes that are used to make something like this. Okay, slightly different, but basically this is what engineers do. They shape material. Here is a titanium wide cord fan blade from Rolls-Royce, which is an incredible piece of technology. Do read about it sometime, not today. Those, make a load of those, stick them in one of those to hang it on the underside of a wing like that to allow a machine like this to fly through the air. Okay, so engineers shape material to do staggering things to allow the building of extraordinary structures like the A380 there. And talking of extraordinary structures, the next word to, uh, to me is build. And if you look at, I wanted a picture of something impressive. That's just an example from civil engineering. It's the Milau Viaduct. So the tallest bridge in the world. Absolutely staggering achievement to get that up and to make it look, I think, so beautiful. Some say it's a bit of a blight on the French countryside, but I think it's a remarkable way they've blended it in, have done something very modern in a very natural environment. Now, the three words I have much more fun with, though, because those first six are all, pff, yeah, they're right. The next three, and actually four, are really important. The first one is the why question. Engineers are very, very good, like little children, always asking why, 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 why can't we do this better? Why is it like that? An example of this is, I think, illustrated by this product here, which is called the Anyway Up Cup, which was designed by Mandy Haberman. It's a lovely story of an engineering mind saying, why is it like that? And the story that's told is that Mandy was at a friend's house and saw a toddler being given a drink in a cup and told, now be careful, don't spill it. A toddler, okay? White carpet, black currant juice, no, don't spill it. And so he thought, that's ridiculous. And what said, woo, off it goes. Drink everywhere, right old mess. We should do something simple to make the drinking cup better for those who can't, might, would otherwise perhaps spill their drink. And came up with this very, very simple but brilliantly clever solution, which is the Anyway Up Cup. And all it is, all it is, it's very clever, is a concave piece of plastic with a slit in it. So when it's like that in the cup, the top little nozzle there, 
Uh, you can tip it upside down, nothing comes out because it's, it's concave. But if you suck on it, it goes convex like that. The slit opens up slightly, the drink flows. And as soon as you release, it goes back again. Brilliantly simple, but fantastically clever. All caused by somebody saying, I think there's a better way of doing this. Why is it like that? Next favorite word is the yes word. Rising to a challenge, doing something amazing, on demand. And perhaps the best example of this is given by the speech by one John F. Kennedy, which 1962, I believe it was. So he had a whole bunch of engineers, knew something was coming, all right? They knew that there's going to be an exciting bit of news for engineering. And here's the speech. Here are the exact words. I believe that this nation, the United States, should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon. The engineers went wild. They went, wow. This nice man is going to give us billions of dollars to build rockets. This is the best thing ever. And he went, whoa, 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 haven't finished yet. And returning him safely to Earth. Ah, now, that's a bit trickier. Um, on a simple engineering mindset, just f put a person in a rocket and fire it. You know, see what happens. So that's an example of yes, and the result of which was the extraordinary achievement of the Saturn V rocket. And I just have to point it out every time, but... You know, all of this is engine predominantly fuel, 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 a few bits and bobs. Right up there, that tiny little bit there has got three people in it. And all of that is to get three people up in the air. It's just amazing. And all of that is to get this spindly-looking craft pootling around the moon so it can deliver this man to take pictures like that, looking back at the Earth and saying, my goodness, that's all we've got. That's it. If we can't make this work, we're doomed. It was such a powerful moment and such an extraordinary achievement. So that's the yes word. The number nine <laughs> word, very important. I'm going to give you two oops examples because there are many, many types of mistakes. Okay? The first type of mistake is illustrated by this wonderful, beautiful, uh, just exotic piece of technology called the um, Genesis probe. And this was sent off into space back in 2001, I think. Don't worry about the details, but basically a three-year mission to collect um, samples from solar wind, the far side of the moon, and bring it safely back to Earth. Okay, very clever stuff. So it wasn't just going to disappear off and keep going. It had to come back and deliver the samples. So they said, fine, well, we can get it back and do clever things. It'll come plummeting back to Earth, but it'll have uh, too much speed, so it's got to deploy a parachute. Even with a parachute, it's going to go too fast. So they got some Hollywood stunt helicopter pilots to practice catching in flight something de descending by, by parachute. Did it absolutely fine. What could possibly have go gone wrong? So around it came, spinning along, they were sitting there with the binoculars, and boom! 193 miles an hour, smack into the earth. Teensy problem was, that little device there, that little accelerometer, had been put in upside down. So the, as it was coming down, all the computers were saying, oh, we're getting near Earth, shouldn't we deploy the parachute? And the little accelerometer said, no, no problem at all, carry on. <laughs> and so splat, several hundreds of millions of dollars later, they went, oop, that was a mistake. So that's an operational error. Hopefully you won't make it twice, but it's not the sort of error you want to make too many times. The error I want to talk about, though, is much more interesting, I think, which is this one. So here we have the wonderful Apple Newton. Okay, and I have here, uh, not quite original, but early... Apple Newton. So think back to 1992. That's when computers were real computers. They had keyboards. They had cathode ray tube monitors, laptops. You know, you needed to go to a gym to bodybuild to be able to carry a laptop. Apple and one particular guy, Jonathan Ive, designed this extraordinary machine. Okay, a device that had no keyboard. It was a computer you could put into your pocket. Well, fairly large pocket, but it was a, ideally a pocket-sized computer with no keyboard that would recognize your natural handwriting. So now you may go, yeah, well, so what? But back then, that was an extraordinary achievement. That was way ahead of what anybody else had done. It was a staggering achievement. Unfortunately, it was a bit too far ahead. It was a commercial flop. But they learned a huge amount from that. And in a way, there's a direct descendancy from that, Apple Newton, straight through to the iPad there. Okay, so what we've seen is the same guy made that, mis if you like, mistake by pushing the boundaries too far, but over time, pulled it back a bit, pulled it back a bit, pulled it back a bit, technology advanced, and we ended up with a fantastic, unbelievably popular-selling iPad and all the other tablet devices. 
So that's, a, in a way, a good mistake. It's, it's a pushing the boundaries a bit further to see what can we really achieve. So there you have it. There are nine really interesting, I think, uh, and essential words for engineers illustrated by these um, little icons there. Now, the alert ones amongst you will say, you said there were ten words. You put up nine. Quite right. The tenth word is, it sounds a bit trite, but I think it is really important. It's this word. Okay? If you think, I challenge you to sit here now, drive home, go out for dinner, do whatever you do, and look around and not see the staggering achievements of engineering. Our modern lives could, would not be possible without the hard work of engineers. And if we're stupid enough to think all that stuff's been done, we don't need any more engineers, we are sadly deluding ourselves, I believe. If you think also of incredible things, and not just what we've done, what we need now, what we're doing now, things such as tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, helping the body to heal itself, that the interface between engineering and the life sciences is a huge area. We need engineers in that space. If we think of things like 3D printing, rapid prototyping, the ability soon to manufacture products on a completely customized, right close to the point of use is going to happen in the future. And that's going to be a staggering uh, change in the way the whole global industrial system operates. So I think this is an unacceptable statement from the children, that engineering is not important. How not important? Ridiculous. So, but I also think that the 10-year-olds were right. Engineers do fix things. And it's very important we encourage people into this space to fix things because we have this extraordinary problem here of a planet that's getting a bit wobbly at the moment and presents through the number of, of challenges that are there, a vast number of opportunities to do amazing things. And if we're not encouraging young people, i.e. under 10, to think about this, I think that's very sad. So I also think we should be repositioning engineering. Engineering as the superhero. So I got a, a colleague of mine, Alex Driver, kindly drew this picture when I described what I was trying to do. He said, you need to say, look, the engineers are the caped crusaders. Look, that's what they should be doing. You know, they are the ones who've done amazing things. And people say, well, yeah, really? Can we actually change perception like this? For those who've been around for a little longer than others, think back to how entrepreneurship was viewed in the UK back in the 1970s. It was very much uh, the Del Boy Trotter, the Arthur Daly view of entrepreneurship, pff, nothing. Now, primetime TV, it's an explicit part of government strategy to say, we want more entrepreneurs. I think we can do the same with engineering as well. So, as we draw to the last minute, all I'd say is, if you think I've identified a problem that's real, and I'm not just deluding myself, if you think that it is something about a, a misconception about what engineering is amongst young people, and if you want to be part of the solution for that, I'd really like to hear from you. So please get in touch with me um, at the coffee break or just look me up on Google. There may be many Tims, but there are very few Tim Minchels. Thank you very much for your time.